In this unit of the course, which is about the impact of the new digital media communication and information technologies on scholarship, research, in general, the way we process knowledge in the university and in society at large, I brought the argument through text analysis to the topic of social network analysis and literature. That's where we'll have to let it rest. There's no more time in the course. This entire set of uh, issues is part of the field of digital humanities, which is strongly related to the digital social sciences and in many ways to the digital sciences on campus as well. If you're interested in these kinds of uh, issues and methods, you might be interested in courses that I, with my colleagues, Jeremy Douglas and Rita Raley, offer in the English department in our center called Transcriptions, a digital humanities research center in literature, culture, and media. It um, offers courses in the digital humanities and new media studies. Uh, it offers English majors a specialization called literature and the culture of information. You get a certificate for taking four courses um, among your electives there. And of course, those courses are open to others as well. We're hoping uh, that the new data science major will be approved by the U University of California system. I told you about that earlier. In which case, uh, English, history, and some other humanities in arts departments will be one of the required elective areas of the data science major. So I may be able to see many of you who are interested in these issues in the future. I'm about to conclude the course with a reflection on the general impact that the digital media communication and information technologies and channel through them all the modern trends in media information and communication that we've been studying have on literature. That's the appropriate resting point for an English department course on all these issues. But before I do so, I thought I would um, expand the uh, view of the camera, as it were, to the larger topic of the impact of modern and digital media communication and information on the humanities. That's too large a topic because there's so many kinds of humanities historically and especially now in the contemporary present. But we'll get a feel for what that larger picture looks like if we just, before coming to literature, look at one other field of humanities work, and that is history. One of the mainstream humanities and one of the uh, areas of the humanities that has also been impacted very heavily by the new digital media, information and communication technologies, the digital humanities. This is the cover of my first book. It was titled Wordsworth, The Sense of History, 1989. In the 1980s, I started my scholarly career as part of a set of scholars in literary studies who were interested in something called the new historicism. It's not relevant to tell you about that. What is relevant is that um, my study of Wordsworth had a lot to do with the history that he was immersed in, the impact on his life, for example, the French Revolution. The picture on the cover of my book was taken from this horizontal format watercolor. Technically, the media form is a gouache uh, watercolor by Charles Etienne Le Guin, roughly around 1790, depicting the preparations for the Fete or Festival of Federation to take place on July 14th, 1790, one year after the fall of the Bastille in 1789. The Fete of Federation would be the crowning moment when the king, still alive, this was the French Revolution, still in its sunny, bright side, would commemorate the new constitutional monarchy on the Champ de Mars in Paris. This scene depicts the famous Journée des Bruets, the uh, day of the wheelbarrows, in which, in preparation for the Fete of Federation, hundreds of thousands of Parisian citizens of all descriptions and social classes poured out to help dig out and level the Champ de Mar um, amphitheater, build up seats and ramps around it to host the Fete of Federation. What the picture describes is this scene, and it describes it in a format which is devoted to an open view. Openness, ideologically, being the opposite of the enclosure that was marked by the Bastille, which fell a year ago. Openness being part of the new transparency, the new leveling impulse of the French Revolution. I've often suggested to you in this course that sometimes it's helpful to um, look aside from the analytical perspective to the creative or creator's author's perspective. Here, I think that's very helpful as well. Put yourself in the um, seat, as it were, of the artist, Charles Etienne uh, Le Guin. How is he gonna manage a depiction of openness, 
especially in a horizontal form like this? How do you give structure to openness and transparency? The French were not very good at that in the 18th century. They were borrowing, in this case, from the real geniuses of structuring open horizontal space, the Netherlandish poets, the, excuse me, uh, painters, the painters of the low countries of um, the Dutch, for example. They had perfected the tactic compositionally of structuring open horizontal space according to the diagonals to the 45 degree points on the horizon. Either one diagonal, as you see here in this picture, or sometimes in an X shape, another diagonal crossing it to the other 45 degree point. That's the initial compositional structure of this openness. On that structure, Le Guay begins to populate the picture. And here, you can see that he's struggling. He kind of sprinkles these little tableau groups of people, each self-contained, each not having much of a um, um, relationship to any other group. And in fact, you can see if you know art history that he is simply borrowing from very old visual iconography descended from centuries ago from religious painting and history painting. Each group, like an adoration, composed on a frontal plane symmetrically in um, flat order or in linear progress as in the adoration of the Magi where the Magi come parading to the Madonna and child. He has no visual vocabulary can, can, that can render what is actually happening in the French Revolution in this scene. And what is happening is the great topic, the great subject of history from the French Revolution on through the Russian Revolution, through the 20th century, through masses of people. That subject is the crowd, the mob, the, the masses, um, all this new energy coming from some new entity, something that was not a king or a dynasty, the old-fashioned topics of history. In all the books of the historians from the French Revolution on, you see some of the titles here. The great topic of history above all in the last two centuries has been the identity, nature, function, behavior, the credibility, the essence of the mob, the crowd. The crowd in the French Revolution, history from below, the making of the English working class, what the Birmingham Cultural Studies School called uh, cultural studies, meaning popular culture, the so-called new cultural history of the 1980s and after. You'll recognize that social network analysis, where I left off the introduction to the digital humanities, is the next chapter in the story. Information, media, and um, communication technologies rendered in digital form is not extraneous to the topic of history. It is one of the chapters in the main narrative of modern historiography. It is our age's next attempt to understand what the mob, what the crowd, what the 20th century in McLuhan's time had called mass, as in mass media, but which is no longer an adequate idea today. It's our attempt to understand what the topic of history is, society in a modern sense. Le Guay had real difficulty understanding the uh, crowd and, and mob because his visual iconography grew out of an aristocratic time, the ancien regimes. This is, um, these are depictions of Versailles. If you've ever been to Versailles, everything is symmetrical. The gardens, the buildings, everything is perfect hierarchy. It's an aristocratic sensibility. I've taught courses on design, exterior and interior and landscape before as a part of my cultural studies work. It's really interesting to see how visual texture and uh, composition go hand in hand with the larger epistemological, social, political, and uh, ideological investments of an era. Le Guay was invested in an old style iconography that was part of the social politics of his time. The British were already well more advanced and more modern than the French in the 18th century. They had a form of landscape gardening and also um, design in other fields called the picturesque. You see classic instances of this here, Thomas Hearn's depiction for a book on landscape called The Picturesque and a picturesque tree on the bottom. Picturesque sensibility and uh, composition had to do with a winding past, overgrown vegetation, things that break out of symmetry, things that sort of are, suggest mobs and crowds of like weeds and vegetations and so on. The famous British garden was perceived to be more democratic and modern than the French Versailles style garden. I tell you that a hundred years from now, when people look back on our time now, they will see that our visual imagination and therefore our epistemic, social, political, and other phenomenology will look like this.
This is our attempt to understand something like what Le Guay was trying to wrestle with. He tried to put little tableau groups of people together. We found a way to connect those tableau groups. We call those groups nodes and the connections between them, edges and links. Social network analysis and the look and feel of it will be seen, I bet you anything, 100 years from now by historians as a distinctive mm, visual epistemology, but also a social political phenomenology of our age. It cannot be any more urgent than right now to develop a feeling for what a new sense of society is this network thing that is the mass, that is the mob, that is the crowd. This is a um, academic study of a Black Lives related um, uh, event that happened uh, four years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. Of course, it's too soon for the equivalent studies to occur about what's been happening the last week and a half to two weeks, but those studies will appear. You see on the right in this um, article, a Gephi um, visualization of the social network of Twitter posts having to do with Black Lives Matter in 2016. It is urgent to our society now to develop, as I put it earlier, its chapter in the continuing saga of the great topic of modern history. What is the crowd? What is the mass? What is what the French called the people? And then we continue to call the people. One people, but many people as well. A social network graph is our understanding of what the mass is. It carries our particular accents, our particular emphases, our need for an understanding of both diversity and uniformity connected up with each other in some way. These visualizations and the um, mental paradigms they make possible are still not adequate. We don't fully yet understand what these kinds of graphs are telling us. Let's say that you could locate yourself in your tweet in that mass of uh, red or green tweets that you see in the screen, what does that actually tell you about your place in society? We are just beginning to mm, ask the right kinds of questions. If I had more time, I would then tell you about other kinds of digital tools that the historians favor. They use maps a lot, GIS generated maps on which to populate uh, demographics, uh, transportation networks, all as placeholders for understanding what the modern mass crowd and people are doing. So now what about literature? What is the impact that the new information technologies are having on literature and channeled through the new information media and communication technologies, the long history of modern such methods descended from the French Revolution and on? You recognize, um, though you may not have noticed, that the background I've been using for today is this one. In fact, uh, you may want to go back through the lectures and my PowerPoints at some point, just take a note of all the backgrounds that I've used. I'm a kind of hobbyist of backgrounds. Many of them are drawn from projects and um, works that um, my teams and I have created, some from other people, many from um, photographs that I've taken. I'm a collector of neutral photographs that can be used as PowerPoint slides, and I often trade them with other scholars. This particular background is from a project that I led here in the University of California system over about the six or seven campuses from 2005 to 2010. It's called Transliteracies, Research in the Technological, Social, and Cultural Practices of Online Reading. I've been thinking about the impact of the new technologies on reading, literacy, and literature for a long time. I actually began 10 years before that 2005 project, uh, roughly around 1994 or 1995. And so I come to you, not so much with answers to the question, what is the impact of the long development of modern media communication and information on literature? But let's say two questions, two facing questions that are symmetrical with each other. The first is, what is literature for? in the information age. And the second, the mirror version of that, what is information for in literature? I'll repeat that just to let that sink in. What is literature for in the information age? What is information for in literature?
And I think the answer, or if answer is too strong a word, then possibility, hypothesis, is noise. The historian's great topic is the crowd, the mass, the mob. The literary equivalent of that, connected as you will see with the notion of the mass, the mob, the crowd, is noise, which is a light motif that we have been following throughout our course since at least the time of um, Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver. To put it in question form rather than an answer form, is literature the noise of media communication information? Are media communication and information the noise of literature? And I'll repeat that one more time just to let it sink in. Is literature the noise of media communication information? Are media communication information the noise of literature? A lot of work has been done that um, has prepared literary scholars and others to pose the answer of noise in questions like that. This is William Paulson's book, The Noise of Culture, Literary Texts in a World of Information. He descends from a 20th century and late 20th century set of theoretical movements in France and elsewhere, which have given us works like this by Jacques Derrida, writing and difference. Derrida, as you may know, is a philosopher of so-called deconstruction, more generally of post-structuralism and of several other kinds of postmodern understandings of language in particular in the late 20th century. Um, I cannot, in the minute that I have here, explain deconstruction to you or post-structuralism, but the cover of this book of essays of his, Writing and Difference, I think gives you a very good intuitive sense of what Derrida meant by deconstruction, his understanding of language. Why the appropriate title for this book actually is Writing and Difference. You see that the word difference there is uh, composite in such a way that it interferes with itself, like noise, it's kind of a noisy signal of that word difference. According to Derrida, language never simply means anything. It never stabilizes in that way. No sooner do you think a word or a phrase or a sentence means something than some other possible potential for meaning comes into view. A trace of meaning, maybe from elsewhere, he calls it intertextuality, or sometimes he calls it deferred meaning. The meaning is never fully here. It's always about to arrive. You get part of the meaning before the language shifts destabilizes becoming something else. Language is full of potential for multiple and often contradictory kinds of meanings. It refuses to stabilize in the way that a scientific proposition would force you to say that A equals B. In language, A equals B, but C, D, E, Z, et cetera. Lisa Samuels and Jerome McCann work very much in that tradition of thought but they work in a mode that is um, creative rather than analytical. You might ponder the word deconstruction. Often in popular uh, discourse, like in newspapers, um, people read the word deconstruction to emphasize purely its D side, its destructive side, taking things apart analytically. But the word really means decon, it's a paradox. It's also a constructive exercise. Samuels and McGann perform a constructive act of destructive analysis on poems like this by Wallace Stevens, The Snowman. They ask themselves the question, what would it be like to deform, as they say, a poem in such a way as to release new potentials for meaning in it, see the difference in meaning that a poem actually has contained within it if you, for example, read it backwards or read only the nouns in it or only the adjectives or verbs or shift the order of a poem around in different kinds of ways. Mark Sample, in a blog post responding to Samuels and McGann, pushes the argument even further. He critiques Samuels and McGann by saying they want to do that deformative exercise so that they understand the poem better, so that they can put it back together in a clearer way. It's like hum putting Humpty Dumpty back together, he says. I, he says, want to propose a theory and practice of a deformed humanities that is more radical than that. The humanities of broken, twisted things and what is broken and twisted is also beautiful and a bearer of knowledge. The deformed humanities is an origami crane, a piece of paper contorted into an object of startling insight and beauty. His full thought is, we don't need to put Humpty Dumpty back together. Again, we don't need to 
unfold that beautiful origami crane, flatten it out into a piece of paper, into a message that we can read. Let's leave them broken. That's what humanities truly do when they are at their best. He actually performs a deformative exercise himself using the N plus seven machine or algorithm, which is descended from so-called cut-up methods early in the 20th century by William Burroughs and others, and a French school of philosophers, artists, and others called the Olipo, uh, O-U-L-I-P-O. This is the N plus seven machine or algorithm. It simply replaces automatically every word in a passage with the next word seven down in the dictionary, and you get passages like this. I want to propose a therapist and a practitioner of deformed humanoids. I want to propose a thermostat and prankster of a deformed humorist. Rosa Mankman, whose glitch momentum I ask you to read excerpts from and whose homepage I ask you to take a look at just for fun, she gives us one of the most articulate formulations of the deformation, the deconstruction, the uh, difference that uh, language has if you introduce within it as integral to the notion of literature, noise, kind of a noisy information as the heart of literature. This is Mengman. She thinks about Claude Shannon's information theory. You remember this famous diagram by Shannon here in which uh, noise is there in an external source to be uh, you know, quarantined as much as possible from the transmission of the signal. But you remember as well that noise, the concept, is also integral to the idea of the signal in Shannon and Weaver because the notion of a signal has to do with entropy and therefore with noise. We've thought a lot about that in this course, uh, all through Pynchon's novel, for example. This is Mankman, therefore. It's important to realize that in Shannon's communication model, information is not only obfuscated by noise, it is also dependent upon it, noise, for correct transmission. Without noise, either encoded within the original message as entropy or present from sources outside the channel, there cannot be a functioning channel. Noise serves to contextualize information. Information needs noise to be transmitted successfully. Consequently, without noise, there is no information. And just for fun, I've uh, glitched Shannon's diagram using a little online tool called the uh, GIF Melter, it's kind of fun to play around with. And I'll show you some other deformance tools that uh, you might have fun with. Um, here, here, by the way, is the N plus seven machine. This is kind of fun, it's called the Eater of Meaning. So you put into it a, a web URL, I'll put in my homepage. And it produces a beautiful rendering of your page with every piece of language eaten up and garbled and spat back out again. So let's see. What have I written recently? Frivolous theodicus pasted. Digging's hum divided as technicality. Operates leaf to then polyalphabetic. Blouses essen. Blouses essen. Oh my God, I don't eat blouses. Um, artichokes. All right. So I seem to be a specialist in artichokes. Try this out sometime on some page that you're interested in. It's kind of interesting to play around with. Writes Mankman, I describe the glitch as an actual or simulated break from an expected or conventional flow of information or meaning within digital communication systems that results in a perceived accident or error. But her full thought, of course, is that that error actually unfolds a kind of noisiness that is not outside of what's there in the work, but internal to it as one of its potential meanings, as uh, Samuels and McGann might have said. This is what she does with her own photograph. I've actually met her in um, Amsterdam when I went out to visit one time. She glitches her own image. She's a specialist in the technology of visual glitching a phrase, of course, that starts in the music field, in music glitching that she borrows for the uh, visual work that she's a performer with. She actually does jam sessions of uh, visual glitching in live performance mode. I described the glitch, as she says, as an actual simulated break from expected or conventional flow of information or meaning within digital communication systems that results in a perceived accent or error. Through the distorted images and behaviors of machinic outputs, 
the viewer is thrown into a more risky realm of image and non-image, meaning and non-meaning, truth and interpretation. So the glitch is there in a work of art or of literature. Within it, and that is the important um, 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 uh, preposition there, it's not outside the work, it is integral to the nature of the work. And we realize the integrity of error within a work of glitch, we'll see that the stake, the bet we make in uncovering the errors and noisiness within a work is to come to a perspective on a work in which we understand that there can be a more risky realm of image and non-image, meaning and non-meaning, truth and interpretation, something that we did not know, that we needed even to know about. I'll rewrite her passage for literature. Through the distorted images and behaviors of literature, the reader is thrown into a more risky realm of image and non-image, meaning and non-meaning, truth and interpretation. Think about how important the concept of noise, error, and let's say glitch has been to so much of literary theory and the works of literature that we have touched upon in this course. Several times in the course, I've talked to you about the new critics in America and their uh, practice of so-called close reading. And I refer to this essay in particular by Cleonth Brooks, The Heresy of Paraphrase. For Brooks, literature, like a poem, is different from, say, a newspaper story or scientific um, article because its intent is not clean, clear, transparent information, but always a kind of a scrambling up, an introduction of noise or distortion in the information. This is what he writes. Indeed, whatever statement we may seize upon as incorporating the meaning of the poem, immediately the imagery and the rhythm seem to set up tensions with it, warping and twisting it, qualifying and revising it. When we consider the statement immersed in the poem, it presents itself to us like the stick immersed in the pool of water, warped and bent. Indeed, whatever the statement, it will always show itself as deflected away from a positive, straightforward formulation. That could be Rosa Mankman writing about the glitch. Of course, that's many years before we even had the notion of glitching. Think about Pynchon's Crying of Lot 49. It's a work of literature that is full of glitches, let's call it. Noise, errors in language from the punning level up where some other meaning comes in sideways from like nowhere out of the blue to interfere with the straightforward meaning of a sentence. She knew because she had held him, the old sailor that he suffered DTs. Behind the initials was a metaphor or delirium tremens, a trembling unfurrowing of the mind's plowshare. And then of course, the great glitch, the great interference in the signal is the tristral. If you think of the regular US postal system as the channel of information, then tristral, the alternative communication system is the noise in the signal, it's the interfering information signal. For there was either some tristral beyond the appearance of the legacy America, or there was just America. And if there was just America, then it seemed the only way she, Oedipa, could continue and manage to be at all relevant to it was as an alien, unfurled, assumed full circle into some paranoia. That's the noise in the signal in Pynchon. A novel that, as I put it, was about not uh, counterculture or subculture so much as what I called um, um, internal culture, a kind of an um, intraculture, where the interesting difference in society is not outside society, but within it. Within, as I put it, the Tupperware bowl. Here's an actual glitch of the kind of postage stamps that um, Pynchon dealt with as his visual emblem of glitching and noising. This is not a made up stamp, this is a real stamp. This was the famous inverted Jenny US postage stamp which was issued once or twice in 1918. The latest sale I've just read on Wikipedia at uh, so for just under $1 million. Neuromancer surely contains a lot of noise in the signal as well. In fact, this is the cover of the original edition by Rick Berry. Rick Berry is the artist who is known for being the first artist of a book cover to use digital methods to create his illustration. This is a um, illustration of the Panther Modern's riot scene in the sense net building in the work. And you'll recognize that from this passage in the novel. The Panther Moderns allowed four minutes for their first move to take effect, then injected a second carefully prepared dose of information. If Rosa Mankland were to analyze the novel, she would say they are the glitch artists, um, you know, supreme in this work. 
This time they shot it directly into the SenseNet building's internal video system. At 12.04.03, every screen in the building strobed for 18 seconds in a frequency that produced seizures in a susceptible segment of SenseNet employees. Then something only vaguely like a human face filled the screens. His features stretched across asymmetrical expanses of bone like some obscene mercator projection. Blue lips parted wetly as the twisted the elongated jaw moved. Something, perhaps a hand, a thing like a reddish clump of gnarled roots fumbled toward the camera, blurred, and vanished. That's what Rick Barry is illustrating here. That is glitch, if anything is. Gripa, a book of the dead. Think about the deliberate act of, let's call it meaning vandalism that occurs in the work by which the poem seems to erase itself. The actual erasure consists of, as I called it, an act of information vandalism, a deliberate introduction of noise. There are a number of possible mechanisms, uh, Quinn DuPont writes after the uh, hackers contest he sponsored that finally decoded what was happening in the disk. There are a number of possible mechanisms to cause a self-modifying program to run only once. Anonymous programmer of Agrippa shows a simple mechanism, write a large string of data over a portion of the binary that contains necessary run routines. In the archive source code printout, this self-destruct mechanism wrote 40,000 ASCII characters to a specified offset, leaving a string of 320,000 binary ones to corrupt the program. This self-destruct routine, the programmer called make some shit. And I've often thought, I'm grinning here, as you can see me up in the small corner of your screen, I'm grinning here because I've often thought that this would be a good, although somewhat base name for what literature is. Literature basically comes down to making some shit. <laughs> making some shit up in a way that interferes with the clear, transparent signals in information of society. And of course, we've seen this several times in the course, the art pair of net artists, Jody, who are actually the original inspiration of uh, Rosa Mankman's glitch momentum and glitch work. This is their famous home screen. Um, one of the Jody pair came to UCSB about two years ago to lecture in our media arts and technology program. I went to listen to him and um, he told us the or origin of this home screen. He was coding uh, those um, you know, ASCII depictions of uh, nuclear bombs that I told you about earlier when he made a mistake. He, this is a classic programmer's mistake, he neglected to put in a closed bracket to one or tag to one of the HTML tags. And this is what resulted. And he and his partner looked at the screen and said, huh, we kind of like that. <laughs> this is a better depiction of what we're after in our work than the clear transmission of the signal. Cool, they used to say on the web. When the web was new, the web was full of cool sites and collections of cool pages. I got interested in this and actually wrote a book that started with a notion of what was cool in the web. It's a book called The Laws of Cool Knowledge work and the culture of information. And when I thought about it, cool at the time, and it continues to this day still, means the use of information, media, and communication technologies to do something other than transmit clear information, media, and communication, often to do the exact reverse of that, to introduce a contradiction, a conflict in the signal, an interference, a glitch that performs the opposite of informing us or communicating to us something. This is what I write. What's really cool after all? At the moment of truth on the coolest websites at that time in the 1990s, when such sites are most seriously deeply cool, no information is forthcoming. Cool is the aporia, the irresolvable puzzle or gap in meaning uh, in information. In whatever form and on whatever scale, excessive graphics, egregious animation, precious slang, surplus hy hypertext and so on, cool is information designed to resist information. Not so much noise in the information theory sense as information fed back into its own signal to create a standing interference pattern, a paradox pattern. Structured as information designed to resist information, cool is a paradoxical gesture by which an ethos of the unknown struggles to arise in the midst of knowledge work. I'll come back to the unknown later. But I'll just here instance one example of what I mean by information designed to resist information that everyone in the early days of the web found cool. On many of the cool sites of the day, as they were called, um, there was a site called Paul's Extra Refrigerator. Paul, whoever he, he was, had outfitted his extra refrigerator with sensors inside. You could, on the web, check in at any time to see what was happening in his refrigerator. Is the light on or off? What was the temperature? 
how much butter was there. And this is an example of using the most advanced information technology at the time to do what exactly? Well, it gives us some information, but it actually doesn't give us any meaningful information. It's kind of a parody or send up of information technology. It's a, it's a kind of an information disguise. Um, a refrigerator is a kind of a primitive version of a server. It's a parody of what a server of information is. Even more clear are web pages like the Jody homepage, which use the highest, most advanced information technology of the time to render the opposite of information, to resist the clarity of information, to introduce noise in the signal. So that's one possible answer to the question, what is literature in the age of information, which I pose in question form because, of course, there is no sure answer to any of these questions. It is literature the noise of media, communication, information. Is the true function of literature today, in the modern age, and especially in the contemporary age of knowledge work, to introduce noise in the signal, to remind us that even the clearest communication, clearest media picture, has the potential for different meanings in it, other meanings that we barely know how to understand. If literature can truly unlock the noise of potentiality in it, even though it looks like deformance, as Samuels and McGann would say, Maybe it will have fulfilled its mission today. The facing question is this one. Are media communication information the noise of literature? By which I mean this. Does literature itself, descended from avant-garde movements in the 20th century, does literature itself need to be challenged by media information and information just as it is challenging media information and information in return. This actually is a strong thesis about the nature of modern literature, that modern literature is distinctive because it begins to absorb media information and communication from a larger sphere of society. And at this point, the argument that there's noise involved in literature converges with my previous argument that what is the major topic for history in modern times is the mob, the crowd the mass. This is a theory of literature. Um, it's one of many from the 20th century that articulate a thesis like this. This is Mikhail Bakhtin's uh, Russian philosopher and literary critic's book, The Dialogic Imagination, where, among other places, he articulates the notion of what he calls heteroglossia. Hetero meaning other, glossia meaning tongues or languages or vocabulary sets. According to Bakhtin, what the novel is, as the exemplary form of modern literature beyond old poetry, epic poems, and so on, but the modern novel is, it's a sounding board. It's a symphony of many, many kinds of voices in society. Symphony is the wrong word because these voices are not necessarily in tune with each other. They are in dissensus with each other, speaking over with each other, speaking against each other. A novel is a, is a sounding board for this large, diffracted, um, counter symphony of the voice of the mob of the mass of the modern democratic peoples. You know you're on the scene of a novel, says um, um, Bakhtin, when the author doesn't have all the vocabulary, all the language in control, when there are other voices that interrupt any line of thought. Heteroglossia is the introduction of mass media information and communication in the novel. When you think about it that way, you understand that the long trend of modern communication, media, and information has been to articulate the voice, not the voice, but the hetero voice, the heteroglossic voice, the multiple voices of the mob. That's why McLuhan was so uh, preoccupied with what the 20th century called mass media, and that's why today we are so preoccupied with forms of digital media that mutate the notion of broadcast mad mass media from the 20th century and make it something else like social network uh, graphs. Digital humanities, text analysis, topic modeling, social network analysis, and so on, is a way we today use information technologies to listen to the heteroglossia in literature and in other works. So what do these uh, data mining tools do that I've been explaining to you? They don't let us listen in a clear way to the signal, let's say, from one novelist in the 19th century. They insist that we listen simultaneously to 2,978 other novels, as in that article by Ryan Hughes and Long the Cop that I asked you to read. They insist, in other words, that no signal come clean 
without the company of umpteen other heteroglossic signals, all of which are crossing each other and interfering with each other, giving us a glimpse of a larger entity. I called it a hyper object in my last class. The great social hyper object is what the historians call the mass, the mob, uh, the crowd. That's why some literary critics think that the most distinctive, the most unique, the um, most spectacular novels of the 20th century and into the 21st century are novels that become like information devices, can be called information novels. So people have written of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, as a kind of um, encyclopedic novel. There's so much information packed into it and so many different perspectives and voices. So too, people have written of Tom uh, Pynchon's uh, great epic work, Gravity's Rainbow, as an encyclopedic novel for many of the same reasons, as well as another work that often falls into the same camp, David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest. More recent novels actually make use of information-like forms and sometimes information technology to become encyclopedic, to fill the pages with the look and feel and sometimes actual text of information, such as Mark Daniel Lewski's House of Leaves, which you see in the lower left, and a really interesting novel called The, uh, the Raw Shark Text by Stephen Paul de Wright. This is what I'm thinking. And these are the set of thoughts with which I will leave you in this course. I'm suggesting to you that the function of media communication and information on the one hand and of literature on the other are to is to destabilize each other through noise. Media information communication introduces a kind of noisiness, a heteroglossia in literature. It disturbs any clean idea of what a literary work should be. And in reverse, reciprocally, the function of literature today is to introduce a certain kind of noise that interferes with media communication and information, confuses it, makes it less than clear, unlocks other kinds of potential meaning, different meanings that are possible. Noise is at that sweet spot between media communication and information on the one hand and literature on the other that marks a collision point of knowledge and the unknown. Each sphere knows something, what thinks it knows something, the media artists, uh, communication people on the one hand and literary artists on the other. Each is made uncomfortable by the domain of other knowledge introduced through noisy means by the other. That is the collision spot that really my course has been about how we think about media communication information together with humanistic forms of knowledge like literature where they do not exactly coincide with each other, and in fact, in where they often seem to interfere and collide with each other. As Rosa Menkman says again, through the distorted images and behaviors of machining outputs, the viewer is thrown into a more risky realm of image and non-image, meaning and non-meaning, truth and interpretation. That's a good formulation of that collision point, as I call it, of knowledge and the unknown. If you're a literary artist and you listen truly to what media communication and information is telling us today, communicating from the masses, the mob, the crowd, the social networks, you're going to reach a point of something different from traditional literature, something in the space between image and non-image, meaning and non-meaning, truth and interpretation. And it works in reverse as well. If you're a serious um, specialist in the media fields, in the communication fields, in the information fields, you need to listen to what works of literature, what works in the humanities, what artists are telling you to unlock the different perspectives on the clean message you think that you are transmitting. Uh, me, to listen to them, to understand that what you think is a good purpose in information technology, such as a social network uh, site, such as Facebook or Twitter, also has other not so good possibilities in it, unethical and otherwise. If I had given you that class about GIS mapping, at this point, I would look at old maps where they did not know what was in the sea and would write simple things like this, here be dragons. The dragons meaning the unknown beyond which each sphere of knowledge, media communication, information on the one hand, literature on the other, thinks that it knows. And I think that there's no better way to bring this course to an end than to ask you 
to contemplate the unknown in the age of knowledge work. I myself personally think that for all of us in the university and in society, this may be the great topic for our generation. We live in an age of knowledge work. Everybody is surveyed. Everyone's data is in a database or in a social graph, is aggregated by Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc. We live in an age of apparently total knowledge work. The question for us is, what remains unknown in the age of knowledge work? Or better, what should remain unknown and can be treasured because it is unknown? In past epochs, the unknown went under other names. For example, some ages called the unknown god. Other ages, like the Romantics, uh, I started with words with today, called it nature. I'm going to close the course with a American romantic slash modernist that carries on the uh, romantic tradition of nature. I'm going to end with a passage from William Faulkner's long short story, The Bear, first published in 1942, both in a magazine and in a volume of such stories called Go Down Moses. The story is told from the perspective of um, what starts out as a um, young boy, Ike McCasson, in Faulkner's uh, mythical Mississippi County, Yachtapatalfa County. They've all been hunting Old Ben, the legendary gigantic bear who's been mauling the dogs, etc. No one can find the bear. Ike McCasson goes out by himself one day. Can't find the bear. Sam Fathers, legendary tracker, gives him advice. And finally, the end of the story, he's able to see the bear. How? By leaving. The important verb in the text is relinquished. By relinquishing his knowledge devices, his compass, and his watch. That which allows him to know things about where he is in the woods, to track things. By noon, he was far beyond the crossing of the little bayou, farther into the new and alien country than he had ever been, traveling now not only by the compass, but by the old heavy biscuit thick silver watch which had been his father's. He had left the camp nine hours ago. Nine hours from now, dark would already have been an hour old. He stopped for the first time since he had risen from the log when he could see the compass face at last and looked about, mopping his sweating face on his leg. He had already relinquished, given up his claim to, given up his stake for, of his will because of his need in humility and peace and without regret. Yet apparently that had not been enough. The leaving of the gun was not enough. He stood for a moment, a child, alien and lost in the green and soaring gloom of the markless wilderness. Then he relinquished completely to it. It was the wash and the compass. He was still tainted. He removed the link chain of the one and the loop thong of the other from his overalls and hung them on a bush and leaned the stick beside them and entered the woods. And at that point, skipping a bit in the text, he's led by the suddenly appearing ball, the bear, um, paw prints back to where he was in the beginning, finding his watch and his compass all over again, but seeing them from outside their perspective. Even as he looked up, he saw the next one, bear ball, paw print, and moving, the one beyond it. Moving, not hurrying, running but merely keeping pace with them as they appeared before him as though they were being shaped out of thin air, just one constant pace short of where he would lose them forever and be lost forever himself, tireless, eager, without doubt or dread, panting a little above the strong, rapid little hammer of his heart, emerging suddenly into a little glade in the wilderness, coalesced. It rushed, soundless and solidified, the tree, the bush, the compass, and the wash glinting where a ray of sunlight touched them. Then he saw the bear. It did not emerge up here. It was just there, immobile, fixed in the green and windless noon's hot dampling, dampling, not as big as he had dreamed it, but as big as he had expected, bigger, dimensionless against the dappled obscurity looking at him. Then it moved. <coughs> it crossed the glade without haste, walking for an instant into the sun's full glare and out of it, and stopped again and looked back at him across one shoulder. Then it was gone. He didn't walk into the woods. It faded, sank back into the wilderness without motion as he had watched the fish, a huge old bass sink back into the dark depths of its pool and vanish without even any movement of its fins. 
The bear in this short story is the unknown. The last remaining trace of the old wilderness that is trackless in the woods that cannot be found using any surveillance technology, a compass or a watch that has to be faced on its own terms after relinquishing, giving up one's claim to, giving up one's stake in the knowledge instruments of today. That's the way I'm reading this passage allegorically for our purpose. The unknown. I can't think of a better way to leave you in this course than to ask you to think about what should remain unknown today in your life, in the life of your society, in the life of our world. Or rather, not just what needs to be remained, to remain unknown, to be relinquished in that way, but how to fit our experience of knowledge together with our need for some treasured space of the unknown society. The world needs a proper rapprochement, a proper renegotiation of the relationship between that which is unknowable and that which we know using our media, communication, and information devices today. The end. Thanks for being me with me this quarter. I'm going to stop share so that uh, we can.